So, uh, good morning, by the way. Uh, don't want to jump in without saying hello, but uh, we are in a conversation new starting, uh, leading us up to uh, Easter. So we're in the season of Lent. For those of you that are observing Lent uh, along with me, we're giving up the good for sake of laying hold of what's best, and uh, we're really seeking to lean into the nature of our sin and, uh, and the goodness of God. And so as we're journeying through Lent, we're reminded of how important it is that we prepare ourselves for um, for Easter, for Easter Sunday and the resurrection of, of Christ. And so uh, we're journeying in that, in, in what we're calling icon, or leaning into symbols uh, of, of normal things that lead us or point us towards the divine. Icons are, uh, by definition, uh, described as representing Christ, things that point us to Christ. And so over the next couple of weeks, we'll be looking at uh, various things in and around our lives, things that are tangible and readily available to us, that will spark a reminder, that's my hope, that say will spark a reminder that Christ is with us. And so this morning we're talking about water. Uh, no more of a normal element than water. It's everywhere. It's readily available. It's uh, ever near us. I have a, an emotional support water bottle that I keep near me. And so uh, you never know when you're going to need hydration. Uh, water is life. There's no way around it. We have to have water. And uh, we're reminded uh, consistently that we need to be more hydrated. It's like one more thing to put on my list of like, I got to stay hydrated. But the idea though is that without water, we don't have life. A people can only gather as broad and as wide as water connects us. So uh, you may want to be uh, living on your own. You may want to be one of these crazy people who uh, want to be a nomad and uh, find your own way off the beaten path, but you've got to take water. We have to find ways to, to provide water. And so um, as we gather, as human beings, we gather together with a shared resource of, uh, of this element that provides life for us. And we're really thankful for the water that we pay a lot of money for. Uh, what I know is that there's no living organism on earth that can survive without it. That we don't just need water. Everything needs water. And where water touches life, happens. And I, I saw this morning as I was uh, getting ready out my back window, uh, a little, little out of the, all the dead and, and brown and gross, there's like a little bit of yellow, just some Easter flowers popping up. Because when water touches, uh, life happens. And what I believe to be true is that uh, we need this in our lives, not just practically but spiritually. That is, we go searching practically all over uh, literally the universe looking for water. We'd love to live on some other planet. I don't know why we're so eager to leave this one, uh, but we can't until we find water that for us, we go searching for life and, and for this natural resource. It's so vital that we protect it. We fence it, uh, or you can't go down to the water treatment plant and just hang out. It's, it's secured for a reason. You contaminate the water, you contaminate the people. When the well is dry, the people perish, and, and we're all connected by this intrinsic need for water. 60% uh, of our body is made up of it. it. It lubricates our body. It regulates our uh, body temperature. It helps us flush waste, and, and it's essential for life. And yet, nothing spiritual or practical begins with us. It, everything begins with God. That water quenches thirst because God decided and declared that it would be so. So we understand that everything begins with God. But the first thing I want you to note is that water brings life. There's no way around it. Water brings life. Our bodies are constantly losing the very thing that we need to survive. We are in this like weird, unintentional battle where if you don't drink water, you're not going to feel good. And the more you drink, the better you feel. And if you drink too much, you don't feel great. And we're constantly working to replenish the thing that we need the most in our modern society, though. Uh, we take water for granted. A couple of weeks ago uh, on a Monday morning, it's perfect timing, uh, our, our house gets going about 6.15 every, every uh, school day, and so I wake up, I'm the first one up, I uh, go to the restroom and I turn the water faucet on, fully expecting water to come flooding out and there's nothing. I had the beautiful and wonderful opportunity to tell everyone, we have three toilets, you get one flush each toilet, and there's five of us, so be wise and be courteous. Uh, nobody could brush their teeth. We had to find bottles of water. Fortunately, I keep an emotional support bottle, so I had plenty. I was fine. Everybody else struggled. The idea was that I take for granted water. I would not have been shocked if I turned the faucet on and water came out. I was shocked that it didn't. 
And it proves that we live in a society where we have the very thing that we need readily available, but in the Middle East during the first century, water would have been scarce. It wouldn't have been as commonplace as it is here. The people uh, were very much aware of their need for water and for rain. And so uh, you can see throughout history where people would create dances and lowercase g gods that they would pray to and petition to for rains because they knew if it didn't rain, they wouldn't survive. Here it doesn't rain for a while and our garden looks a little sad and, you know, the grass dies out and we're really upset about it. But they would die. They needed God to provide for them. And in John 7, we find uh, that there's a festival that transpires, and uh, it's called the Festival of Tabernacles. And for seven days, they would have this festival, and on the eighth day, uh, festivals and parades and, and worshipers would all lead to the Pool of Shalom. And it was this great celebration. This is where water was kept, right in the city center. So if we were still living this way, we would have a well in the center of our city, and we would all uh, situate ourselves around it. And we would come and gather and draw water for the day, and we would talk. And I guess now it's the water cooler in an office, but at the time it would be the city center. And everybody knew where life was, and they knew where the water was. And in this festival, the priests, they had two golden pitchers. One was full of wine, and the other would be dipped out and uh, filled with the water from this pool. And then his flutes played, and choirs sang, and the Israelites chanted praises the procession would head back into the temple as a symbol that this is where life is held. If you want to find life, you come to the tabernacle. If you want to find health and healing, you come to the tabernacle. The whole procession heads back to the temple and they celebrate the most essential element of our lives and water. And if you want spiritual life, they would say you got to come to the tabernacle. This is where life was kept. But on the eighth day, something different would happen. Throughout history, for generations, the eighth day, there was no parade. There was no flutes. There was no choir. There was no procession. There was no dipping of pitchers. But on the eighth day, there was a pause. There was silence. They stopped because it was prophesied that one day someone would come and he would bring water. But he wouldn't just bring water. He would be life for us. And so for year after year, they would pause and wait knowing that one day someone was coming. We wouldn't have to go to a place, but we would be the place where people would find life. And so there was this holy pause, this moment. And I can imagine for years, everyone would go, why do we do this? Maybe next year, maybe next year, maybe next year. Maybe we should skip it next year. Why are we waiting? But in this particular time in human history, in John 7, something happens that's different than any other year. On the last and most important day of the festival, Jesus stood up and he cried out, if anyone is thirsty, he should come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. There's something transpiring here that's unique. They're in a desert, everyone's thirsty. Jesus is saying, if anyone's thirsty, everyone's going, I'm thirsty. We're all thirsty. It's dry. It's aired. It's hard to come by water. I don't have a Stanley cup. I've got to go find water at a well. Of course we're thirsty. He had everyone's attention because he didn't isolate. He was communicating to anyone with ears to hear. And this message was important for many reasons. First, because of where he was standing. He said it standing in the temple courts right outside the temple itself. Now, they've been taught that life was found in the temple, and Jesus is standing outside the temple proclaiming that they don't have to go find life anymore. He is life. It's important when he said it. He said it on the last day after all the water had been poured out from the previous days. He says it uh, as he waits for the last day that Jesus says, I am the water that you're going to drink from. I am the life source that you need this was the last time that Jesus would spend in Jerusalem and the last time people would hear from him before he was crucified, before the Passover and his death. And this was the last day of the feast and the last time he would speak for, uh, till, till crucifixion. And so everyone's leaning in just a little closer. It's important because of how he said it. He's crying out, the scriptures say. 
A shout, which was not his normal disposition. His demeanor was typically uh, calm and quiet, but in this moment, he's shouting, and maybe it's to get his voice heard over the clatter and the, the, the people talking. Maybe it's because he wanted to boldly proclaim something vital because it was essential that they not miss what he's saying. Regardless, this was different than his general ministry tone. He's shouting at this point, saying, you don't need to go anywhere to find life. I am life. And if anyone, anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. This is unique because he wasn't isolating people. It didn't matter where you came from. It didn't matter your socioeconomic status. It didn't matter if you were rich, poor, your class system. It didn't matter what was happening in your life. He's saying the only caveat to finding living water is that you recognize that you are actually thirsty. The invitation was broad. It included everyone. It didn't matter your intellectual level. It didn't matter. He says, come to me. His message wasn't limited to those who were able to recognize that they were in a place or in a time. All they needed to recognize was that they needed something that they didn't have. And it's Jesus who describes himself as living water. And he says, if anyone is thirsty, let him find me. That when you are connected to Jesus, there's something that remarkable happens in your life. You don't just have life, but you actually give life. You don't just receive life, but you actually are able to share life with others. We receive grace and mercy and compassion and love, and we love those things. But those are also things we get to give to others. We don't just receive, but we also give that when you drink of Jesus, of streams of living water don't just flow into you, but they actually flow out of you as well. When your life touches Jesus, your soul comes alive. Just like the Easter flowers that break ground, that cold, hard ground, and and the beautiful uh, Kelly green and the, the brightly colored yellow flowers break ground, life begins to spring up inside of us. Beauty breaks through the monotony and and the disgust and the dust and the dirt, that when your soul comes alive, you don't just come alive, but you bring life to others as well. That there's something beautiful that we allow to happen when we don't just receive life, but we give life as well. So if you want to do an assessment of your life, if you're here and you want to know how spiritual you are, ask the people around you if they feel life when you're in their presence. Are you life-giving to others? Do people feel more alive when you're around? Your proof of love and how spiritual you are is how the people around you receive love and grace and compassion and generosity and mercy from you. It's not just about what we take in, but it's about what we give. And in Isaiah 55, Jesus is saying, here, come everyone who is thirsty. Once again, the invitation to the gospel is limited to those who can recognize their need. Come everyone who's thirsty, come to the water. And you without money, You can buy and you can eat. You can be poor and still come and buy in Jesus. All you need to do is recognize your thirst. That's how complex the message of Jesus is. That's how complicated the message of Jesus is. That's the only hurdle, the only caveat, the only gate, whatever verbiage you want to use. That's the only barrier between us and living water is recognizing that we're thirsty. What's interesting though is that We try to find sustainability everywhere else. We try to find life and health and growth and everything else. We go to lots of different areas and avenues and hobbies and and things that are healthy and good and things that are not good, but all of them only bring about life for a point. They only quench a momentary thirst. They only provide momentary joy or momentary satisfaction or momentary peace, but none of them are long lasting. We think that we can live without Christ And we can for a while. But just like going without water, we collapse. You and I, we can survive without food and water for about a week. Some of you you got two weeks on you. I'm not going to say who. I'm just saying. Some of you can go a little longer. Depending on the condition and and the, the environment and on and on. But we get a week. Without food, it's significantly less. With just water, we struggle quickly. And yet, very few, if any of us, have ever tried to go without food and water for any amount of time. The reality is, even if you are able to live a week or two without food or water, you're merely surviving. You're not thriving. You're just getting by. 
And I think a lot of people in, the, in churches, and probably not this one, but many churches like this one, a lot of people who claim to follow Christ and claim to attend church and claim to be a Christian are merely surviving, meaning we have just enough of what we need to get by for a little bit, but not actually thrive. And a lot of us are content with that. I mean, I'm content to be alive, so it's better than not being alive, but the difference between surviving and thriving is the difference between being alive and death. And when we truly start to thrive in our walk with Christ and in our ministry and, and, and in our church and in our community and our family, we see the, the, the catechism, the difference. There's a dramatic difference between uh, simply surviving and thriving. That we're not at our best when we're just surviving. And what Jesus says is that he came to bring living water. He came to be our living water so that we can thrive in our workspace, in our homes, in our relationships, in our families, in our community. That a bottle of water will quench your thirst and it will help you survive. But you'll need to keep drinking to replenish what's taken. When you drink from living water, though, you never thirst again. That God wants to satisfy our every need in him. That what we know about water is water is also adaptable. Water takes on the form uh, that we pour it into. So, uh, Water adapts to the environment that it's in. So if you had a, a vase, it could be a weird misshapen vase, and we took water and we poured it in. Water is going to adapt to the oddly shaped vase. It just is. And, and if it's shallow or if it's uh, cracked or whatever, it's going to adapt to the environment in which uh, we put it into. That if you have an odd shaped vase, the water's not going to change, or the water will change. The vase is not going to change, and it takes the shape that it needs to in order to fill it. And what I love about Jesus is that he meets us exactly where we are. What I love about living water from Jesus is that he takes the shape that we're in in order to fill us. So if you're shallow or you're misshapen or you have some cracks, he's going to take the shape that you invite him in and come into your life. Meaning, if we're broken or busted or misshapen, Jesus doesn't ask us to reshape to come to him. Now, what a lot of times we find in churches, the, the message is often, if you will live like this, look like this, act like this, and believe like this, then you can have living water fill you. And so what we do is we have a lot of people going around trying not to sin and trying to just get by and trying to just look like everybody else and believe like everybody else. And, and it's when we get our vase to look like everybody else's vases, we come and we go, okay, God, fill me. But that's not how it works. He meets us where we are. He doesn't leave us where he finds us, but he meets us where we are, fills us to the capacity that we have, and all of a sudden we find that Jesus is moving and working in our life where we are. And a lot of times we think we have to be something that we're not. And many times we come into a room like this expecting to change in order to receive from Jesus. And he says, no, I want to fill you where you are. We don't have to change to receive. However, we change because we have received. We change because we have received. Not only does Christ adapt to the environment or to, to our lives, to the shape that we're in, he invites us to be adaptive as well that we end up adapting to the environment that we find ourselves in. Now, this doesn't mean we compromise. This doesn't mean we lay down morals or change our personal beliefs, but we're able to adapt to the environment we're in, our schools, our, our uh, workspaces, our, our homes. We're adapting to the environment we're in in order to fill others. And in John seven forty, it says, when some from the crowd heard these words that Jesus spoke, they said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Messiah. But some said, surely the Messiah doesn't come from Galilee, does he? Doesn't the scripture say that the Messiah comes from David's offspring and from the town of Bethlehem where David once lived? So a division occurred among the crowd because of him. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. Now, instead of discussing how fast they could get this living water inside of them, Instead of discussing how their lives are going to be dramatically changed and how their generosity and love and creativity and, and, and compassion for others was going to increase, instead of trying to figure out where and when and how to get this love, they're debating the quality of the water. The word division implies violent dissension. The fact that the scripture says no one laid hands on Jesus I means somebody wanted to. Somebody in the room wanted to put hands on him and said nobody did. 
They're missing the point. Instead of going, this is fantastic, I'm thirsty, I need to receive of living water, they're saying, is this from the right region? Is it good? Does it have fluoride in it? Is, it? is it distilled? I can't take distilled water. They're debating the quality of the water, and they're missing the reality that there's life-giving properties being given to them, that the vision didn't come because Jesus spoke foolishly or uh, gave some kind of a controversial theological uh, dis- discord. It came because Jesus was simply introducing himself as living water and saying, if you're thirsty, come drink. Not only does water adapt to the shape But living water seeks to reshape. Not only does Christ come and adapt to the shape that we're in, messy and broken and uh, out of of shape, but he seeks to reshape us and reform us. Living water doesn't leave us where it finds us. God loves us so much that when we invite him into our lives, he wants to work on us and rework on us and rework on us like clay on a potter's wheel. He keeps shaping and reshaping and forming and reforming. He's never done. He doesn't leave us where he found us when we drink from living water. It changes us. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says you can't put new wine in old wineskin. And there's a reason, because when you put new wine in an old wineskin, wine begins to expand as the gases are released and on and on. It begins to expand. Old wineskins have expanded to their capacity, and so they have nothing left to do but break that a lot of times what happens is when new wine is poured into old wine skin, it's wasted. That when we begin to ask God, I need more living water, we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to be reshaped in the process? See, a lot of us are content. We're fine. I've got my glass. I like the shape of this glass. It, it sips well, and you know, I, I don't need it to be reshaped. It holds enough for me, and, and I just want you to fill it, and then I want to hold on to it. And a lot of us don't want to be reformed. A lot of us don't want to be reshaped. Many of us are trying to drink from the living water without allowing it to stretch us or challenge us or grow us. And we're left with whatever capacity we started with. I want Jesus plus my old life. I want Jesus plus the way I love to live. I want Jesus plus every one of my opinions and uh, political affiliations and everything. I don't want to move or change at all. I just want Jesus to be added to my life as an extra. And that's not the nature of Christ. As Jesus fills us, he adapts to us, but he inevitably shapes us and changes us. And in John 7, everyone had an opinion about who Jesus was. Everyone, everyone who heard what he was saying had an opinion because you cannot be confronted with Jesus and remain neutral. You cannot drink from living water and decide to stay the same. Jesus confronts us with the choice. You can accept or you can reject. But know that if you accept me, I'm gonna find you where you are, but I'm gonna lead you to where I want you to go. He doesn't come to condemn us or shame us, but he wants to lead us. He wants to stretch us. He wants to increase our capacity to love and to serve and to give. And you cannot hold two different opinions about Jesus. The third thing is that water is unstoppable. We know this in nature. We see this in various ways play out. Your backyard might flood and you see there's erosion. We see this in a grand scale with the Grand Canyon where water is carved and cut over years and years. Water is unstoppable. We create dams, uh, but... They have to be monitored all the time. Water is always looking to seep out. It's always looking to move. It's not looking to be contained. No man can harness water. And you and I, we have this responsibility to allow the living water that we have received to flow out of us. That we live our lives in a way that should draw people to Jesus. But what a lot of us do is we go, here's my vase, fill it up. I'm going to put a cap on it. I don't want to spill it. I don't want any leak out. And I want to hold it. And you know that the longer water sits, the more stagnant it becomes. Water is only healthy when it's flowing. It's pouring out and being poured back into. The moment it becomes uh, stale and stagnant, it becomes undrinkable. And a lot of us in our faith, it's become stagnant. We don't want to grow. We don't want to be stretched. We don't want to be more generous or more compassionate or more loving. I don't want to change. I just want to cap the water and hope it stays good for when I actually need it. And that's not the way living water works. Living water is living for a reason. It has to be flowing. 
And as we are shaped by Christ, we pour Jesus into others. And Jesus takes their shape and he challenges and stretches them and, and they grow. And that's the process that we walk through on a regular basis of giving and receiving and giving and receiving. And in John 7, 45, the temple police came to the chief priests and Pharisees who asked them, why haven't you brought him? The police answered, no man ever spoke like this. Then the Pharisees responded, are you being fooled as well? Have any of the rulers or Pharisees believed in him, but the crowd which doesn't know the law is accursed? They're trying to arrest Jesus. They're still arguing over Jesus, still divided over who he is and why he's there. There's still this conversation that's not leading them to receiving living water. That as long as we're divided, we're always going to be limited. That so many of us have damned Jesus up in our lives for various reasons. And we look at people around and go, well, as long as you live like this and look like this and act like this, then you can come and hang out. But until then, I'm not going to pour my life into you. And we create these dams and we stop the flow of water. We stop the living water from going out. We'll keep receiving, but we've stopped it from going out. Many of us are our own limitation, and they're divided. But God's intention for all of us is for your stream of living water to come alongside my stream of water, to come alongside the person behind you and in front of you and watching online. And as our streams of water come together, we form a tsunami. We form a larger stream. And sometimes your stream's a little uh, light and you're running dry and you allow us to pour into you through Christ and, and vice versa. And all of a sudden we find that all of our streams of living water are pouring and we're creating rivers of living water. If my river's a little dry, I'll run beside yours because we're stronger together. God's intention is that we run together. But the question that we have to ask, the question that Jesus poses, the question that you and I have sitting in front of us is do we have a longing for more? I think that's the biggest barrier to receiving streams of living water and being a stream of living water is answering the question, do I have a longing for more? Do I desire for more of God than I have right now? Or are you content? If you're content, that's fine. God's not gonna force himself on you, and I'm certainly not. But I want you to know there's more. There's more life available for us. There's more creativity and generosity and love and, and, and hope available to us. But so many of us have become content with what we have that we don't want more, but we have to long for more love and deeper levels of spiritual transformation. And when we long for more, we find that God begins to fill us at, at an exponential rate. If the answer the, uh, to, to the question is yes, then drink from a different water source. In John 7, it says, if anyone is thirsty, he should just come to me and drink. The one who believes in me, as the scripture has said, will have streams of living water flow from deep within him. See, I think the problem for a lot of us is that we get used to the water that we're drinking. You ever go on vacation somewhere in another state, Florida, and you're like, this water's terrible. And everybody in Florida is like, no, I think it's fine. Like, that's, that's what it's supposed to taste like. You go visit somebody else's house, they have well water, and you're like, this is dirt. And you're like, no, that's, that's normal water. It's different. Why? Because you've gotten accustomed to the water that you drink. I get accustomed to the water that I drink. Spiritually, a lot of us get accustomed to the water that we're drinking. Many of us have been drinking from bitterness and anger and anxiety and fear and stress for so long that that is normal to us. And we look at the byproduct of our life and we go, I don't like that. And we don't look at the reality that we're drinking from these streams. We have social media and we have the news and we have all this terrible stuff going on and we're just drinking it all in. And the byproduct is toxicity in our blood. And if we want a different ending, we want a different mindset, we want a different uh, position in life, if we want to actually be a stream of living water, we have to cut out the things that we're consuming that are filling our lives many times. I, this year, I've just, for whatever reason, decided I believe God wants for me to be like a non-anxious presence in, in people's lives. And I don't even really know what that means other than i got to slow down a little bit and figure out what a non-anxious person does and try to do that. Uh, but it all comes down to what I'm drinking. If I'm drinking stress and worry and fear and anxiety and hurry and, and all of these things, I'm never going to be that non-anxious presence in others' lives. If the water that I'm drinking from is poisoned, then the output of my life is going to be poison as well. 
And if you take a bunch of mud and you put it in water, it's no longer good. But if you drink it, you're not good. There's a problem that's going to happen. And a lot of us are that problem that's happening and we don't understand why. And we fail to connect the stream that we're drinking from with the stream that we're putting out. And if we'll just change where we're drinking from, we'll find that the stream of living water coming from us may be a non-anxious presence. It may be peace and love and hope and, and joy. And in John 4, we find that Jesus is talking to uh, this woman at the well. And you can go back and look at the story later, but what we know is that she's deeply sinful. She's got a lot of problems happening in her life, and Jesus meets her at the well, and, and it seems like it's a chance encounter, but we know it's divine, and Jesus says, can I get a drink? And, and she says, yeah, sure, or whatever. They're conversating, and in John 4, 13, Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. If you drink from the water of bitterness or anger or stress or malice or fear or worry, you will get thirsty again. It's why we are so addicted to 24-hour media and on and on. We have to keep drinking to fill. Jesus is telling this woman, if you drink from this well, you've got to keep drinking. But whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up within him for eternal life. How remarkable is that? You and I have been selling ourselves short where if we'll come to Jesus and the only way we have to do is just say, I'm thirsty. I've been drinking from all of these other places and I'm thirsty. I'm coming to the well that is Jesus Christ Then we receive for life. Jesus didn't only speak of something coming into a person, but out, there's gotta be an outflow. There's gotta be an outflow that the process starts and it ends with Jesus. It just does. It's everything in our lives that starts and ends with Jesus, finding life in Christ, finding cleanliness in Christ, finding righteousness in him, receiving hope found in Jesus. It starts and ends with Jesus. I want to close with this. Uh, microbiologists have discovered that in one ounce of ocean water, if you've got a bottle with you, go ahead and pull that out. I'd say this is about an ounce-ish. One ounce of ocean water, there's 100 million living viruses not bacteria, living viruses. So this summer when you go to the beach, just remember, when you get in the water, there's not ocean water in here, it's not that cool. Uh, it's empty, by the way. Living, back, living viruses, over 100 million in an ounce. Do you know what's fascinating about that? Do you think that God who created heaven and earth is gonna put more power in an ounce of ocean water than inside your life and mine? Why would there be more life and power in the ocean in an ounce than in you and me? Your life is more powerful than you ever know. When you connect to the right source, we become unstoppable. Maybe you've been living apart from the life source. Maybe you've been trying to draw from other places. Maybe you need Jesus in your life. Maybe you need to share eternal life. I'm not sure where you're at, but I want this to be a reminder to you. If you didn't get one, there's someone on the table. I want this to be a reminder to you that we are filling our lives with something. Every one of us are. We're filling our lives with something. And just like a mustard seed doesn't need much, uh, an ocean water doesn't need much, there's life and power in small things. This right here has the capacity when filled with living water to shape and to change our lives. But we have to ask the question, do I want it and what am I filling my life with? Some of us are so full of other things that we have no more room for God. And we've got to find ourselves being poured out, get rid of the old, and be filled back up with what God has for us. And watch how things begin to shift and change for us. If you would, bow your head and close your eyes this morning.